I think more than anything, this place, Arco Santi, is a beautifully crafted stage for every artist. The, the way that art sings through the architecture of this place really continues to give this place life. There are these artistic crafts that go on here, the um, casting of the famous Soleri wind bells in both bronze and ceramic. The buildings themselves are beautiful. And we've placed um, residences in the back wall of a performing arts amphitheater. And it's really fantastic. Walk right outside your door. You, I live in a theater. <laughs> it's really something. Um, Arcosani is a project uh, that was founded in 1970. They broke ground here about 150 activists, architects, engineers, planners, um, and it was really uh, founded by Paulo Soleri, the architect, planner, urbanist. Before the 60s, before the 50s, we didn't really understand the extent of the impact on the planet. And so Soleri is part of this movement of acknowledging that, and he wants to design an alternative type of urban form that may help us live in balance with ecology, with nature, uh, with each other as well. In 1970, he says, you know what, we're going to try and build uh, a real version of this, a city scale version of the theories that he has been developing. For him, it's so important to actually experience your ideal project in the real world. So get it off of the paper and into reality. And so that's what he did here um, in 1970 when uh, so many folks came up and started um, actually digging, building, and constructing materials. When I first came, um, I was interested in this concept of arcology. Uh, where it's ecology and architecture combined, thinking of the city as an organism. I was really curious to think of architecture on the larger scale and how that would affect the human uh, experience. And I've always had this interest in people, kind of like a psychology interest too, and combining that with architecture. And so I thought this would be a great place to learn uh, from that perspective, and it has been, absolutely. Um, it has exceeded my expectations <laughs> as far as that <laughs> realm of understanding. I am currently the freshest batch of citizens here at Arco Santi. Um, I've been here for just shy of two months now, uh, stayed on after finishing my workshop. Um, I wanted to get my feet wet in urban planning. I hoped to go to graduate school for planning after um, my undergraduate in economics and sociology. While studying those subjects, I got a really good grasp on problem analysis, on looking at, on looking at problems of the human condition. Um, but that's kind of where it stopped, and uh, I wanted more. I wanted to be able to not only look at the problems, but to be able to proffer um, ways of moving forward that could remediate the problems that I was so intensely studying. We're at the end of a two-mile dirt road. <laughs> And if it was just us on a ranch at the end of that dirt road, isolated um, from the rest of civilization, eh, it wouldn't be that interesting. But the fact is we get nearly 50,000 people a year coming down that road to see what this is about, to see if they can participate in it. Since 1970, some 7,000 people have taken part in the construction workshops. And really interesting folks come laden with ideas that they're willing to talk about and we have the time to talk about them and we're looking at big picture issues here. For instance, my commute to work on a daily basis is to wake up, slide down a ladder, and there I am in the middle of the office. Even though I do own a car, I almost never use it. Right now, suburban environments mandate that we use a car. Everything's so spread out that we need to drive from point A to point B. The car uh, enables freedom. And I think a key idea within arcology theory, architecture and ecology, which is uh, Soleri's main design theory, um, is that it's a pedestrian environment. You don't use the car. And so that's a, that's a huge change, very difficult to actually implement in the sense that right now about 50% of the average American city's infrastructure is devoted to the car. 
parking garages, arterial roads, the grid, regular garages in people's homes, those take up quite a lot of space. And hence, the, the landscape is disparate. It's completely spread out. And so here, I think he's attempting to prove that you can be afforded the same freedoms that the car might afford the citizen in a suburbia, but without being attached to some sort of high technology, some sort of um, consumptive technology like the automobile. Most of our bodies, our legs, were designed to walk around. So if we could walk around in um, cities, in American cities especially, that'd be a great thing. It'd be a great thing for a whole bunch of reasons. It'd be a great thing for sociability, it'd be great for our health, and it would be great for the federal budget, so much of which is involved in defense spending, and so much of that defense spending is to just keep that oil coming to us so that we can power our cars and the separate buildings that we have. Suburbia really allows people to become disengaged. Um, it allows people not only disengaged from each other spatially, but politically. Uh, you can define the terms of your built environment on this little slice of paradise and everything is according to you. That's great. That's, it's really nice to have that type of freedom. But here we think it's more important to engage in the freedom of working with others to come up with a truly civic solution to our problems. Living here can be really intense. It's like a, a big house at this point. I mean, we have uh, 65 to 70 people on site and we all live pretty close together. And so there's a lot of interaction that happens, kind of like when you have roommates. <laughs> Wash your dishes, right? <laughs> that kind of thing. And the, the dialogue that has to happen um, because of that proximity uh, can be intense, but it teaches you so much about conflict resolution. I think our sentiment here that is that uh, community is really more of a process than an outcome. You know, community is something that you have to continuously work towards, continuously uh, take steps into working together. It's an it's a iterative process of meetings, of conversations, of conflict resolution. It's not just something that pops up uh, suddenly. It really doesn't pop up at all. It is those meetings. It is the process itself. I think that this place prompts you to reflect on the ways in which we interact with the natural world rather than building on the plained, arable, well-irrigated land to start because that would be the most cost-effective place to build. You build on a sheer cliff because we're able to and the flat arable land ought to be left for agriculture. Well, we have a mesquite forest here. They just grow naturally. You don't need to water them at all. They're just part of the desert landscape. and. Mesquite is a legume tree and they produce like a bean pod and so I like to harvest them. It's just kind of become a passion of mine and it's a food source. It was for the natives who lived on this land and I'm trying to help like revive it, I guess, as a food source for us. And so I harvest and have it milled and we do a pancake breakfast and this year was our third annual pancake breakfast. We attempt to develop simple or almost appropriate technologies as opposed to high technologies. You know, there's a lot of high-tech solutions to very basic problems where we think um, if, you're, if your radically sustainable idea or, or object is inaccessible by the poor, then it's neither radical nor sustainable. Uh, that's this notion that if the developing world is going to live like we do, we're going to need something like three and a half, four globes worth of resource to sustain us. That's simply not going to happen. I think we do inspire discussion. Being so close to Phoenix as kind of like our polar opposite of what this concept is, we're at least providing the education and, and place for discussion to make a change. So Argosani, I don't think, has had so much of an impact yet, but here it is. It's not just an interesting idea. It actually exists. People live here, you can visit the place, you can stay here overnight in a series of guest rooms, you can participate in a construction workshop. I'm imagining, and working really hard to make this happen too, that in the future Arcosanti will have been the start of something that is going to be able to transform how we think about ourselves as a species and how we live on the planet.